this is not the Laplace low equations. That step function S, let's just quickly recall what it, what it is. S t minus theta in this particular instance we is the unit step. But it's saying this time, we are used to the unit step occurring at time zero, where we go from zero to one at time zero. If we write the unit step function at t minus theta, what that says essentially is it's a switch. Either we are zero or we're one, and we're zero for all times less than theta, and we're one from time theta onwards. So in other words, this is a switch or a step. Your interpretation of this is this is a switch or a step occurring at time theta. So Given that interpretation for the switch function, we can rewrite, in fact, what y dash of t is as well in a similar manner. y dash of t can be written as the following. We can write it as being 0 for times less than theta. Okay. And that's that's really straightforward to see because it doesn't matter what x dash of t is because this capital S at zero for n times before theta. So we're multiplying whatever x dash is by zero, so we get zero. And then for times from theta onwards, in fact, that is equal to x t minus theta. Simply, this, this, the reason for the switch is that it enforces that any time prior to theta, that y dash is zero. So that y dash we call is a deviation variable. So it simply enforces that deviation variable to be zero any time prior to theta. Yes, Can you explain why we're using the deviation variable instead of We're always going to be using deviation variables from this point on. We can always recover our regular variable by simply adding back the steady state. So our convention is going to be working in deviation between pretty much now on. Okay, so that's one way to interpret what this output y is. Any time before theta, it's simply zero. Times theta and onwards, it's whatever the x function was, theta units backwards in time. So relatively straightforward. And we spent a little bit of time discussing the Laplace transform in that last class. So Let's just recap that the Laplace transform of y dash of t is equal to two parts. It's the Laplace transform of x t minus theta times s t minus theta. So the product of those two. So it's equal, to, if we just emphasize it here, it's equal to x dash t minus theta times the step function t minus theta. And it's not difficult to derive that that is equal to x of s e to the minus theta s. So if you substitute that definition into the definition for the Laplace transform, you can show with a small change of variables that you get for flash transform. So I'll rewrite it over here on the other board. Just to emphasize it. In a slightly different way, we can write it as follows. Y of S on the X of S is e to the minus the X. Okay, so it says that this output that I observe 
given whatever input x of s, that input x of s is observed at y just by a time delay of units theta. And its representation in the Laplace domain is e to the minus theta s. So we can take any function, any input x of s, and simply multiply, multiply by e to the minus theta s. And what that does back in the time domain is simply shift that original function in time by theta units. So e to the theta s in the Laplace domain simply represents a shift in time back in the time domain. That's how we're how we going to interpret and use this. And I want to then cover an example that we looked at last class. And I'm going to modify it just a little bit. You'll see why. <laughs> and give you an engineering interpretation of it after we've done the analysis. So recall last time we said, well, if we have y on s over x on s, and if that will pass transform between output y and input x is given as 1 e to the minus 2x, so 1 plus e to the minus 2x. So notice the difference from the example last time. Last time I had a minus here. So if we change that to a plus, and I'll talk about why I'm changing it to a plus next. So 1 plus e to the minus 2x divided by 4s plus 1. Um, are we still in deviation variables? We're always in deviation variables. <coughs> we just put like that in a little thing, like prime. Yeah, so the primes would pull go. Yeah, so I guess I could, I should write it here as well. If you want. Yeah. This is the problem when you deal with this all the time, you simply drop and the assumption becomes implicit. So y dash of s, x dash of s. And then over here, we could work with the primes as well. Okay, so I'm going to start dropping all the primes. It's just going to, you're going to see that. In fact, we're going to get so lazy that later on, we're going to drop off the S's. Wow. So good at those actual primes. So let's take a look at this. I want you to take a look at that. And when we see this, don't just see it as an algebraic expression. We're going to interpret this from an engineering point of view. And what it does is see it as a breakdown in two parts. We've got 1 over 4s plus 1. And we've got another portion, 1 over 4s plus 1, delayed by 2 units, e to the minus 2 And what we're going to do is, I'm going to say, let x of s a step of three units. So step input we call is three over lowercase units. And if that's the case then we can simply write that as y of s is equal to three over four s plus one plus three over four s plus one <laughs> to the minus two s. And what we said last class is, notice that this is just breaking down the response into two parts. The regular portion and that regular portion delay. Sorry, what happened to the S? What happened to the S? There's the S. This is, if you work through the math, that's where e to the minus theta s arises from. But that, that's the step of class. This s here is the uppercase step. So it's not the Laplace s. This is the lowercase. Sorry about that. That's the notation in the textbook. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, um, the upper step S and the lower case S are we talking about? No. Why is that? 
it's, it's just in the derivation that's confusing. You'll see afterwards you'll become quite used to it and comfortable. Okay. There was another question here. I just have a question about the axis of S equal to V or S. But in the previous one, isn't that equal to S plus 1 or is that just the S? So y over x is equal to that previous one. Right? So that's the output of input representation, the first thing. What's your question? So my input is x of s is 3 over s. So that's what I was over there. So if I bring it over to the right hand side, I get y of s is equal to it's 3 over s, 4s plus 1. So I'm multiplying this by 3 over s, and I multiply that by 3 over s. Okay, so I'm finding the output response y of s when input is 3 over s. So what we said then is that there's this regular portion and the delayed portion. What I'd like you to do is take the inverse of pass transform so that you can find y back in the time limit. So essentially you want to find y dash of t is equal to the response. Okay, and so if you go back to your tables, three, this one, the first part is going to be something that you know all by heart. That's three, one minus the minus t over 4. Okay, that's the first portion of the inversion back to time domain. Everyone with me, this is important. Let's, let's keep together here. So the first portion is 3, 1 minus e to the t over 4. The second portion says, well, recognize it's the same function, just delaying its time. So I just want to spend a little bit of, of emphasis on here. It's the only time I'll ever do this in such detail so that you get a good understanding of what's going on here. <coughs> okay, so what we're saying is essentially I want the inverse of class to transform of 3s, 4s plus 1 times e to the minus 2x. If we look at that back in our definition for time delayed functions, we said, so in red I'm just going to write what the definition is. The inverse of class of x of s e to the minus theta s, that was equal to, you recall, x t minus theta times capital S t minus theta. So now apply that to that function up here in the white chalk.
So we can do the two Laplace inversions separately and then add them. So what should I have over here? Um, three into one minus negative C minus two. And then multiply by the capital S, C minus 3. Okay. So simply do the regular inversion of this function. So there it is. There's the regular function. We've done it already, in fact. And wherever you see t's in that inversion, replace them by t minus theta. So t minus 2 in this case. And then post multiply everything by the step function delayed by theta units. So the regular inversion replacement t's with t minus theta, and then post multiply the entire result by the step function. So back here in the time domain, I can write that as p e one minus e to the minus t minus two over four multiplied by the step function t minus. Now let's, that's all good and well and you're fine and all you've really done is you just manipulated a whole lot of symbols, but we haven't really thought about what that's saying. So let's interpret what this, what this is telling me. One way to look at this is to consider this as follows. And this will help emphasize the theory we learned earlier. This entire system going to write this over here. Okay, so that's what we started off with over here. Notice it's the summation of two parts, and one part is simply the delayed version of the other. So it's saying my output y is made up of two portions. One way you can interpret this is quite simply that you've got one transfer function over here, another transfer function over here, so 3 s over 4s plus 1, and then 3 s 4s plus 1, and then here you've got another transfer function e to the minus 2s. And you take those two transfer functions. So visualize, visualize it in that way. Okay, remember we said systems in series, we multiply their transfer functions. So here I've got two multiplied transfer functions. I can write it as that. Systems that are in parallel, we can add their transfer functions together. So I can simply visualize them as the additive portions. Now, one way we might see this in practice, and this is why the time delays are quite important to us. Let's take an actual, actual example as follows. It's kind of really a little bit more engineering and realistic here. So consider the following case where I've got steam coming in with some flow rate F. <coughs> and that steam then is used to heat two reactors. So it goes into a CSTR and it's used to heat the reactor. So if my CSTR is over here, and I have another CSTR, those two reactors are being heated by the steam. Condenses, forms water, and we just drop it out of the reactor. But the reactor, what we have then is this leaving temperature gets measured. So I measure the temperature T. The second reactor, however, they're identical in size, so they're being operated exactly in the same way, they've got the same volume. But the second reactor to recombine it to that temperature over there, 
<coughs> perhaps the piping has to go around a wall in my building, around a, a pillar or a column, and there's a time delay of about two seconds, say, in that response. Okay. So notice the visual relationship between this diagram here and the one that I have over there. They're identical. Right? Here's my input, my steam. It goes to one transfer function for the first CSTR, goes to another CSTR. The only difference is before I recombine and form these temperatures, just take it up and make it look identical. So there's my outlet temperatures. I get a time delay from that set of reaction. So these systems, this is not an artificial transfer function, this is something that is quite realistic that are in our example. Okay, now that you have that example in your mind, you've got one CSTR and another CSTR, they're identical, and we're combining the two temperatures through this after this delay. What is that going to look like in the time delay? I'm going to post MATLAB code for you so you can try it out, but this is not something that's difficult. What is this going to look like back in the time domain? If I make a step here and put in my steam, steam is going to look like this. Let's make that step input occurring at time zero. Okay, so there's my steam step input. And what I'm interested in is that total temperature observed at the outlet. One of the outlet temperatures from the second CSTR is delayed. The first CSTR is the regular response. So if we looked at that back in the time domain, what is the response going to look like for the first tank? What sort of shape does that response have? We're comfortable with what does this look like in the time domain? When t is equal to zero, we're at zero, right? And then as t gets larger and larger, what do we tend towards? What's my final value going to be? Just for this regular portion from the first series to the <coughs> Three, okay. So it's going to be the sort of exponential rise and it's going to level out at three units. I just realized I shouldn't have used temperature because temperature is not an intensive error. Okay, so because um, <laughs> it's going to blend and, and, and separate out. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't use temperature, we should probably use um, use flows or something else here. You're going to see why this example fails from an engineering point. I've been thinking so. Okay, let's take this response nevertheless. That's my first response from the first CSTR. The second CSTR, what is the instant response going to look like? Remember, how do we, how do we interpret this? So until time t is equal to 2, we're not going to see any effect. Okay. So the second CSTR is going to be a flat line for two units. So there's T equals two, and then what's going to happen? Same shape. Okay. So exactly the same shape, just delayed by two units. So now when we add these two systems together, what's my response going to be? No, because it's a switch. Okay. This is also an important point to recognize. S, capital S here, is simply a switch. It's zero or it's one. So it doesn't affect the shape of one. 
So what is the total response from the system going to be? Well, it's simply the summation of them. So if I sum these, this, I follow the blue curve up till time t equals 2, and then I get another balance. So it's going to come up here and settle out in 6 units. So the effect of the time delay is to simply say, here's my response from the first CSTR in blue, and then the second CSTR is in red. The total response is going to be the summation of the two. Temperature was a bad example. I should not have picked temperature because temperature, when we blend two screens together of three degrees and three degrees, do I get six degrees? No. Oh, okay, so that was my mistake. Uh, because temperature is an intensive variable. If I chose an extensive variable like flow or mass, for example, then that exact then it would have been bad. But I just chose chose a bad example. Okay, so you, but the, the principle of the example is what I want you to understand is that the summation of these two curves simply superimposes back in the time Three kilograms to three kilograms, you get six kilograms. Yeah, so flow, flow would work, mass would work, extensive error. So a bad example, but the principle remains. Okay, so this really should emphasize what time delays do to us and have the effect in the fast domain. They simply turn up as multipliers, and the reason why they turn up as multipliers is because in the block diagram, we can visualize our process as the process without the delay multiplied by this transfer function that represents the delay. What I'd like to look at next is just a little bit of theory around first order systems and just the notation and units. So just a at the theory of first order systems. Now, first order systems we've used and covered extensively in this class. But let's look at what a general first order system is. What, I, what you'll always see me do in your classes is we'll look at some examples and then we'll try to extract the theory from that. So over the past four weeks, we've seen many first order systems. And if you look back at your notes, one thing you'll find is you can always write the first order system as follows. It's how multiplied by dy dt. So y is my time varying output plus that output in the time domain plus a gain k multiplied by an input x and t. Every first <coughs> order system we've considered has that form. Let's take a look at the tank height example. So if you recall, the tank height example said RA dH by dt plus H of t was equal to R times F0. So when we model the tank height example, if you go look back at your ODE, you could have rewritten it in that form. So the implication here is my time constant was R times A. My gain was that vowel resistance R. If you look back at the coffee cup example, we could have also written it in that form. So where I'm, where I'm leaving with this is we want to understand what the units of gain are, what are the units of the time constant, and what is the interpretation of the gain? What should it mean to us? So 
So if we look back at our first order systems, if we take that ODE and do the Laplace transform on it, we can always write that ODE in the Laplace domain as y of s over x of s is by gain k divided by tau s plus 1. If you take the Laplace transform of that first equation over there, rearrange it for y of s over x of s, you get your regular Laplace transform with the gain in the numerator and the time constant divided by uh, <coughs> If you go back to the time domain, remember the purpose of Laplace transforms was to simplify our life when we're dealing with ODEs. Let's just consider the most simplest input of x of s equal to 1. In other words, it's just a constant input of 1. And in that case, we get y of t is equal to k times 1 e to the minus t over tau. 1 minus e to the t over the time constant. Okay, this immediately points out what the units of the time constant are. Which is, what is the units of time constant? Time. To make that equation work, tau, tau must have units of 1 over time, time. just time, <laughs> dimensionless, time. <laughs> okay, so tau has units of time. Always, always, always will have units of time. Okay, if you look back at the tank height example, Back at the tank height example, R had units, if you do a dimensional analysis, R had units of minutes over meters squared. Okay? And area obviously has units of meters squared. So R times A has units of time. If you look back at the coffee cup cooling example, our time constant tau was 1 over the heat transfer coefficient. <coughs> The heat transfer coefficient is units of inverse time, so then the time constant is units of time. Tau always has units of time. Always, always. The next important thing I wanted to point out is what are the units of gain? That gain k, what will its units be? over there on the left hand side to work, what must the units of k Dimensionless? Yeah. Okay. Any 
other? Is it a time over area? Or time over area. Over the yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at it. For that equation to be consistent, tau has units of, so let's rewrite it over here, y plus y equals tau. Okay, times x. So if tau is units of time, and dy by dt has units of y, I'll indicate units of y, whatever they are. So if y is height, if y is flow, or y is temperature, whatever those units of y are, divided by units of time. Okay. So time cancels, and we're left with units of y. The second term, well, that tells us the obvious, it's the units of y, and that makes sense because you've got to add units of y to units of y. Okay. So then on my right hand side, what are the units of gain? Y of x. Okay. So to make this work, the units of k must have the units of y divided by the units of x. So if y and x happen to have the same units, then k will be dimensionless. If y is temperature and k and x is units of flow rate, it's going to have units of temperature divided by units of flow rate. Okay, so gain will always have whatever units to make the system work, to make it balance. Then the final thing, and this really emphasizes what gain means to us. What happens in this ODE at steady state? So at steady state, what do I get? How does this ODE simplify? all goes to zero at steady state. Okay? And if I let the system go long enough and I reach that steady state, I can write this as ys is equal to k times xs. So at steady state, my y reaches its steady state value, my x reaches its steady state value. <coughs> and now you can see why we call the game the game. The gain is the amount by which the input is magnified to get the output. Okay, so it's a word, a term from electrical engineering, the gain of the system, but it gives you an idea of what it's doing. So how much the input is magnified to get the output. Okay, if we look back also, you can get that same understanding, and I'll leave this for you to do in your own time, we can get exactly the same understanding by applying the final value theorem to this equation over here. For, for any step input, and apply the final value theorem, and you'll get that same Last um, small new piece of work I want to introduce is just on dealing with complex inputs. So you consider step inputs into our process as, a, as one form of input, but many times we're not just getting step inputs into a process. We're putting in ramps, and then those ramps become steady, and then they drop down again. 
So the input is actually made up of multiple portions. Take a look at this example. If you start here at 20 units, and I ramp up to 80 units, and this ramp stops at time equal to 40. And then after that, I flatline. So I flatline at 80 units and just keep it at, at that flatline. This input has two parts, F1 and F2. So one way we can see this is to write it as F1 T is equal to 20, the intercept, plus the slope. The slope is 60 over 40 times t. So the linear representation of this function is 20 plus 60 over 40 times time. Change in y over change in x. And the linear, oh, sorry, the representation of f2 of t is equal to 8. So we know what it is in the time domain. But one way we can write this, and this is where I'm going with, um, with the reason of why time delays are also important, this is going to tie in with the start of the lecture, is how can we represent all of that in one line? So here I'm writing it as function f1, function f2. Function f1 only applies from time 0 to 40. Function f2 only applies from 40 onwards. So how can we write this as a single f of t? I want the combination of this and write it as f of t equals and get some, some input. So here's the way we can do this and think about it is we write it as, as we expect. We know that we're going to start at 20 plus 60 over 40 times time. And that's going to be valid for time 0 to 40. So up to t equals 40, this is perfectly true. But from time 40 onwards, that's not true anymore. If we look at time 40 and onwards, if we said this was true, what that implies is that in fact, we keep going up and up and up which is not the case. So we can apply a switch here, okay? And what switch do we apply? That's t minus 40, but now switch is 0 or 1. So one thing we can do, and this is, people see this as a little bit of a trick, but it makes sense, is if I'm going up by that slope, what if I add to the function a negative slope by the same amount? So if I keep going up, I would get that orange line, but if I add to it the same downward slope, the two are going to cancel out and then we get a flat line. So we can write this also as minus 60 over 40 t minus 40 times s t minus 40. Okay? What that does is it says we're going up by this slope of 60 over 40 t, but then from times 40 and onwards, we want to go down by that same amount, and the two will cancel out, and there's my switch to only activate the second, uh, to activate this part, this term, from time 40 and onwards. This is, take, if you take a look at this, one way to do this, so the homework for you is to derive the Laplace transform of this, but you can see where this is going because there's your time delay, but one way just to end up the, the class is to say f of t can also be written as, from time 0 to 40, that's equal to 20 plus 60 over 40t for t less than 40. From time 40 onwards, that's written as 20 
Thank you. 